Good evening everyone. Welcome back to my channel. If you are looking for some help falling asleep tonight, then you are in luck because I'm going to be reading you some stories from the Elder Scrolls series. And it should put you to sleep. We're going to start off tonight's video with a book of riddles. This is actually the yellow book of riddles and it's anonymous. It's quite short and I'm going to be hiding the answers from you. So if you want to take a minute and think about the answers yourself before I them to you. This will be the only part of the video that may require you to stop and think a little bit, and after this, you can feel free to fall asleep. Let's begin. For earnest pleasure and strengthening of the mind, the author here collects all that he has learned of the art of riddling by dint of diligent study and through years of discourse with others of similar inclination. Proposing an puzzling of riddles as a convention of polite, aristocratic Western society. Nobles and social aspirants collect books of riddles and study them, hoping thereby to increase their chances of their appearing sly and witty in conversation. First riddle. A metal neither black nor red as heavy as man's golden greed. What do you do to stay ahead with friend or arrow or steed? What is the answer? I'll give you a moment to think about it. You can pause if you want, but here comes the answer. The answer is lead which rhymes with red, the first line of the riddle. Next riddle. A man says, If you lie to me, I will slay you with my sword. If you tell me the truth, I will slay you with a spell. What must you say to stay alive? Think about it for a moment. And here comes the answer. The answer is, you must say, you will slay me with a sword. And for our last riddle, a Bosmer was slain. The Altmer claims the Dunmer is guilty. The Dunmer says the Khajiit did it. The Orc swears he didn't kill the Bosmer. The Khajiit says the Dunmer is lying. If only one of these speaks the truth, who killed the Bosmer? So think about it. The Almer says the Dunmer did it. The Dunmer says the Khajiit did it. The Orc just says he didn't do it. And the Khajiit says the Dunmer is lying, but only one is telling the truth. And the answer is... The Orc did it. So that was the Yellow Book of Riddles. There's actually two other books of riddles in the Elder Scrolls series, but I looked at them, and one of them doesn't seem to have any riddles in it at all, and the other one, they just weren't very good, so I don't recommend either of them. I only recommend the Yellow Book of Riddles, although it's very short. You can actually gift this book to your child in Skyrim, uh, and get a gift of charity. So, 
we're moving right along to the next story of the evening. That is The Gold Ribbon of Merit, and the author of this book is Empyrean Broom. And uh, this is actually an archery skill book, which you'll, I mean, you'll understand why when you hear the book. Ready? Go ahead. In that early springtime morning, pale sunlight flickered behind the morning mist, floating through the trees as Templar and Stringpool made their way to the clearing. Neither had been back in High Rock, let alone in their favorite woods, for four years. The trees had changed little, even if they had. Stringpool had a handsome blonde mustache now, stiffened and spiked with wax. Templar seemed to be a completely alien creature to the young lad who searched for adventure in the ancient grove. He was much quieter, as if scarred within as well as without. They each carried their bows and quivers with extra care as they maneuvered their way through the clusters of vine and branch. This is the path that used to lead to your house, isn't it, old boy? asked Stringpool. Templar glanced at the overgrowth and nodded before continuing on. I thought so, said Stringpole, and laughed. I remember it because you used to run down it every time you got a bloody nose. I know I can't offend you, but I have to say, it's hard to believe that you ended up a soldier. How's your family? asked Templar. The same. A bit more pompous, if that's possible. It's obvious they wish I'd come back from the academy. But there's nothing much for me here, at least not until I collect my inheritance. Did you see I got a gold ribbon of merit in archery? <laughs> How could I miss it? said Templar. Ah, uh, yes, I nearly forgot that the families put it in the Great Hall. Very ostentatiously. I suppose you can actually see it through the picture window. Silly, but I hope the peasants are impressed. The clearing opened up before them, where the mist settled on the grass, enveloping it in an opaque, chilly vapor. Burlap targets were arranged around in a semicircle, several meters apart, like sentinels. You've been practicing, observed Templar. Well, a bit. I've only been back in town for a few days, said Stringpole with a smile. My parents said you got here a week ago? That's right. My units camped a few miles east, and I thought I'd visit the old haunts. A lot's changed. I could hardly recognize anything at all. Templar looked down at the valley below, to the vast, empty-tilled ground, stretching for miles around. It looks like a good planting. My family's rather spread out since yours left. There was some discussion, I think, about keeping your old house up, but it seemed a little sentimental, especially as there was fertile ground beneath. Stringpool strung his bow carefully. It was a beautiful piece of art, darkest ebony and spun silver filigrees, handcrafted for him in Wayrest. He looked over at Templar stringing his bow and felt a twinge of pity. It was a sad, weathered utensil bound together with strips of fabric. If that's how they taught you to string your bow, you need some advisors from the academy in that army of yours, said Stringpool as gently as he could. The untightened loop is supposed to look like an X in an O. Yours looks like a C in a Y. It works for me, said Templar. I should tell you, I won't be able to make an afternoon of this. I'm supposed to join my unit this evening. Stringpool began to feel annoyed by his old friend. If he was angry about his family losing their land, why couldn't he just say it? Why did he come back to the valley at all? He watched Templar knock his first arrow taking aim at a target, and coughed. I'm sorry, but I can't in good faith send you back to the army without a little new wisdom. There are three types of draw. Three fingers, thumb and index, thumb and two fingers. Then there's the thumb draw, which I like, but you see, Stringpool showed Templar the small leather loop fastened on the cord of his bow. You need to have one of these thingies, or you'll tear your thumb right off. I think I like my stupid method best. Don't be pig-headed, Templar. They didn't give me the gold ribbon of merit for nothing. 
I demonstrated shooting from under a shield, standing, sitting, squatting, kneeling, and sitting on horseback. This is practical information I'm imparting for the sake of our friendship, which I, at least, haven't completely forgotten. Sweet Keener, if I remember when you were just in a wheelie little squirt, begging for this kind of honest guidance. Templar looked at Stringpool for a moment, and lowered his bow. Show me. Stringpool relaxed, shook away the tensions that had been building. He did his exercise, drawing the bow back to his eyebrow, his mustache, his chest, his earlobe. There are three ways of shooting, snatching and releasing in one continuous motion, like the Bosmer do. Holding with a short draw and a pause before releasing, like the Khajiit. And partial draw, pause, final draw. Stringpool fired the arrow into the center of the target with cool precision. And release, which I prefer. Very nice, said Templar. Now you, said Stringpool. He helped Templar select a grip, knock his arrow correctly, and take aim. A smile grew on Templar's face, the first time Stringble had seen such a childlike expression on the war-edged visage all afternoon. When Templar released the arrow, it rocketed high over the top of the target and into the valley below, where it disappeared from sight. Not bad, said Templar. No, not bad, said Stringpool, feeling friendly once again. If you practice, you should be able to focus your aim a little bit. The two shot a few more practice bolts before parting ways. Templar began the long trek east to his unit's camp, and Stringpool wound his way down to the woods to the valley in his family's mansion. He hummed a little tune he learned at the academy as he passed the great lawn, and walked up to the front door, pleased with himself for helping his old friend. It entirely escaped his attention that the large picture window was broken but he noticed right away when he came into the great hall and saw Templar's wild shot bulb sticking in his gold ribbon of merit. What did you think about that story? I enjoy it quite a bit. It's a little bit of a, a parable, maybe, about bragging, <laughs> bragging to old friends thinking that you are better than them, and about skill, right? Not everyone has to do things the same way, and there are different ways of shooting a bow, so to speak. The next book is called Surfeit of Thieves by Anis Nuru, and I have to say this one is Maybe a little bit more uh, dark. <laughs> I'll try to make it as relaxing as I can for you all. Okay. This looks interesting, said Indique, his eyes narrowing to observe the black caravan making its way to the spires of the secluded castle. A gaudy alien coat of arms marked each carriage the lacquer glistening in the light of the moons. Who do you suppose they are? <laughs> Very obviously well off, smiled his partner, Haraya. Perhaps some new imperial cult dedicated to the acquisition of wealth? Go into town and find out what you can about the castle, said Indique. I'll see if I can learn anything about who these strangers are. We meet on this hill tomorrow night. Haraya had two great skills, picking locks picking information. By dusk of the following day, she had returned to the hill, and Deke joined her an hour later. The place is called Ald Olra, she explained. It dates back to the second era, when a collection of nobles built it to protect themselves during one of the epidemics. They didn't want any of the diseased masses to get into their midst and spread the plague, so they built up quite a sophisticated security system for the time. Of course, it's mostly fallen and ruined, but I have a good idea about what kind of locks and traps might still be operational. What did you find out? I wasn't nearly so successful, frowned Indique. 
No one seemed to have any idea about the group, even that they were here. I was about to give up, but at the charter house, I met a monk who said that his masters were a hermetic group called the Order of Saint Ignua. I talked to him for some time, this fellow name of uh, Parathian, and it seems they're having some sort of ritual feast tonight. Are they wealthy? asked Haraya impatiently. Embarrassingly so, according to the fellow, but they're only at the castle for tonight. I have my picks on me, winked Haraya. Opportunity has smiled on us. She drew a diagram of the castle in the dirt. The main hall and the kitchen were near the front gate, and the stables and secured armory were in the back. The thieves had a system that never failed. Haraya would find a way into the castle and collect as much loot as possible, while Indique provided the distraction. He waited until his partner had scaled the wall before rapping on the gate. Perhaps this time he would be a bard or a lost adventurer. The details were the most fun to improvise. Harai heard Indique talking to the woman who came to the gate, but she was too far away to hear the words exchanged. He was evidently successful. A moment later, she heard the door shut. The man had charm. She would give him that. Only a few of the traps and locks to the armory had been set. Undoubtedly, many of the keys had been lost in time. Whatever servants had been in charge of securing the order's treasures had brought a few new locks to a fix. It took extra time to maneuver the intricate hasps and bolts of the new traps before proceeding to the old, but still working systems, but her eye found her heart beating with anticipation. Whatever lay beyond the door, she thought, must be of sufficient value to merit such protection. When at last the door swung quietly open, the thief found her avaricious dreams pale to reality. A mountain golden treasure, ancient relics glimmering with untapped magicka, weaponry of matchless quality, gemstones the size of her fist, row after row of strange potions, and stacks of valuable documents and scrolls. She was so enthralled by the sight, she did not hear the man behind her approach. You must be Lady Tresset, said the voice, and she jumped. It was a monk in a black hooded robe, intricately woven with silver and gold threads. For a moment she could not speak. This was the sort of encounter that Indique loved, but she could think of to do nothing but n nod her head with what she hoped looked like certainty. I I'm afraid I'm a little lost, she stammered. I can see that, the man laughed. That's the armory. I'll show you the way to the dining hall. We were afraid you weren't going to arrive. The feast is nearly over. Hariah followed the monk across the courtyard to the double doors leading to the dining hall. A robe identical to the one he was wearing hung on a hook outside, and he handed it to her with a knowing smile. She slipped it on. She mimicked him as she lowered the hood over her head and entered the hall. Torches illuminated the figures within around the large table. Each wore the uniform black robe that covered all features, and from the look of things, the feast was over. Empty plates, platters, and glasses filled every inch of the wood, with only the faintest spots and dribbles of the food remaining. It was a breaking of the fast, it seemed. For a moment, Hariah stopped to think about the poor, lost Lady Tresset, who had missed her opportunity for gluttony. The only unusual item on the table was its centerpiece, a huge golden hourglass, which was on its last minute's worth of sand. Though each person looked alike, some were sleeping, some were chatting merrily to one another, and one was playing a lute. Ah, uh, Indique's lute, she noticed, and then noticed Indique's ring on the man's finger. Her eye was suddenly grateful for the anonymity of the hood. Perhaps Indique would not realize that it was she, and that she had blundered. Dress it, said the young man to the assembled, who turned on his one onto her and burst into applause. The conscious members of the order arose to kiss her hand and introduce themselves. Nirdla, Cyrilek, Kyler. The names got 
stranger. Tony up. Hetilitus. No, it up. She could not help laughing. I understand. It's all backwards. Your real names are Aldrin, Celius, Relic, Pwanot, Stilith, Therathian. Of course, said the young man. Won't you have a seat? Say, giggled Haraya, getting into the spirit of the mask and taking an empty chair. I suppose that when the hourglass runs out, the backwards names go back to normal? That's correct, Tressid, said the woman next to her. It's just one of our order's little amusements. This castle seemed like the appropriately ironic venue for our feast, devised as it was to shun the plague victims who were, in their way, a walking dead. Haraya felt herself light-headed from the odor of the torches, and bumped into the sleeping man next to her. He fell, face forward, onto the table. Poor as rock, Zifrif, said a neighboring man, helping to prop the body up. He's given us so much. Haraya stumbled to her feet, and began walking uncertainly for the front gate. Where are you going, Dressed? asked one of the figures, his voice taking on an unpleasant, mocking quality. Mm, my name isn't Tressa, she mumbled, gripping in Deke's arm. I'm sorry, partner, we need to go. The last crumb of sand fell in the hourglass as the man pulled back his hood. It was not in Deke. It was not even human a stretched grotesquerie of a man with hungry eyes and a wide mouth filled with tusk-like fangs. Haraya fell back into the chair of the figure they called as Rock Zerth. His hood fell open, revealing the pallid, bloodless face of Indique. As she began to scream, they fell on her. In her last living moment, her eye finally spelled Tressid backwards. Did you manage to figure out the catch before it happened? Did you spell Tressid backwards? We're now going to lighten things up a little bit with an explorer's guide to Skyrim. This is a book you may come across quite frequently, but maybe you find yourself not needing to read it, as you think you know quite a bit about Skyrim. So we're going to read it today. And the author is Marcus Carvain, Viscount of Bruma, an explorer's guide to Skyrim. Far too often, noble visitors from Cyrodiil see little more of Skyrim than the view from their carriage. To be sure, this coarse, uncivilized province is far from hospitable, but it is also a place of fierce, wild beauty, with grand vistas and inspiring natural wonders awaiting those with the will to seek them out and the refinement to truly appreciate them. If you are of a mind to see Skyrim for yourself, I recommend beginning your adventures as I did by seeking out the Stones of Fate. No doubt you are taken aback by the name as I once was. The provincials and village folk have all manner of dark tales about these ancient monuments, stories of necromantic rituals and fell spirits, of great and terrible powers conferred on any who dare touch them. The stories are, as Jarl Ikroth once told me, A bit uncouth, but you get the point. To be sure, keep your guards with you at all times. Brigands and wild animals are never to be taken lightly. But the stones themselves are nothing to fear. Quite the contrary, their proximity to cities and roads makes them ideal destinations for the novice explorer, and many boast spectacular views that made the journey well worth the effort. To whet your appetite, here are four such locations. Most travelers enter Skyrim by way of Helgen, 
gateway to the north. If you find yourself in this backwater hovel, consider taking an afternoon's ride to the north, keeping to the road as it winds down the cliffs at the eastern end of Lake Yelanolta. Just off the path on a small bluff lie the three guardian stones, the greatest concentration of standing stones in all of Skyrim. The view of the lake here at sunset is simply sublime. Visitors from Chaitanol will pass through Riften, a city of intrigue and larceny since Tiber Septim's day. If you seek adventure in the Rift, leave the city by the southern gate and cast your gaze upon the bluff that rises to the south. Atop it sits the Shadow Stone, a fitting symbol for the City of Thieves. Whiterun is the heart of Skyrim, its towering palace rivaling even the great castles of Cyrodiil. But should you tire of the Jarl's hospitality, another adventure awaits a few hours east of the city, along the road that rises above White River Gorge. The Ritual Stone can be found atop the lone hill that rises on the north side of the road, set into an ancient monument. Take time to soak in the incredible view of Whiterun, the tundra, and the gorge from this unique spot. More seasoned explorers may wish to visit Markarth, the ancient city of stone far to the west. The recent Forsworn Rebellion has made travel in the reach perilous, but for those determined to seek adventure no matter the cost, another stone can be found to the east of the city perched on the mountain above Kolskegger Mine. Though the climb is difficult, reaching the summit is a milestone any explorer could be proud of. There are other stones of fate to be found in Skyrim. I myself have seen several more. Perched on the most remote mountain peaks, or reaved in fog amid the northern marshes. But the true joy of exploration is in the discovery, and so I leave the rest to you. Maybe eight. Guide your steps. So this is very useful. If you find yourself seeking out all of the stones. Although, if you are a seasoned Skyrim explorer, I reckon that you have found all of these before. Next, we're going to read Three Thieves, another anonymous book. That is about, I take it, three thieves. And this one also is slightly more dark than, say, a guide to Skyrim. Right. The problem with thieves today, said Letos, is the lack of technique. I know there's no honor among thieves, and there never was, but there used to be some pride, some skill, some basic creativity. It really makes those of us with a sense of history despair. Emmeline sneered, slamming down his flagon of grief violently on the rough-hewn table. Bluvec, what do you want us to say? You asks us, what do you do when you see a guard? And I says, stab the fetcher in the back. What do you prefer? We challenge him to a game of chits? So much ambition. So little education, said Ledos with a sigh. My dear friends, we aren't mugging some Nord tourist fresh off the ferry. The Cobbler's Guild Hall may not sound intimidating, but tonight, when the dues collection is housed there before being sent to the bank, the security's going to be tighter than Aquama's ass. You can't just stab at every back you encounter and expect to make it to the vaults. Why don't you explain specifically what you'd like us to do? asked Galcia calmly, trying to keep the tone of the group down. Most locals at the Plot and Plaster Corner Club in Telerun knew enough not to listen in, but she knew better than to take any chances. The common thief, said Lidos, pouring himself more grief, warming to his subject, sticks his dagger in his opponent's back. This may slay the target, but more often gives him time to scream and drench the attacker with blood. Not good. Now, a good throat slashing properly executed can both slay and silence guard, and leave the thief relatively blood-free. And, after all, 
after the robbery. We don't want people seeing a bunch of blood-soaked butchers running through the streets, even in Teleroon, that's likely to warrant suspicion. If you can catch your victim lying asleep or resting, you are in an excellent position. You place one hand over the mouth with your thumb over his chin, then you use your other hand to slit the throat and quickly turn the head to one side so the body bleeds out away from you. There is a risk here of becoming bloodstained if you don't move quickly enough. If you're unsure, strangle the victim first to avoid the blood that tends to spurt out in three-foot jets when someone is stabbed while alive. A very good friend of mine, a thief in Nisus, whose name I will mention, swears by the strangle and slash technique. Simply put, you grab your victim's throat from behind him while throttling him, you batter his face against the opposite wall. While the victim is thus rendered unconscious, you slash his throat while still holding him from behind, and risk of staining one's clothes if blood is practically non-existent. The classic technique, which requires less grappling than my friend's variation, is to place one hand over the victim's mouth and then saw through the throat in three or four strokes, rather like playing a violin. It requires little effort, and while there's quite a lot of blood, it all jets forward away from you. There's no reason, when one knows one is going to be slitting some throats, not to take some precautions and bring some extra equipment. The best neck hackers I know generally carry a bit of wadded cloth on the aft side of their knives to keep blood from getting on their cuffs. It's impractical for this sort of assignment, but when you're only anticipating one or two victims, nothing beats throwing a sack over the target's head, drawing the string tight, and then supplying the killing blow or blows. And Malin laughed loudly. Can I see a demonstration sometime? Very soon, said Letos, if Galcia has done her job. Galcia brought out the map of the guild house, freshly stolen, and they began to detail out the strategy. The last several hours had been a whirlwind through it all. In less than a day, the three had met, formulated a plan, bought or stolen the necessary ingredients, and were about to execute it. Not one of the three was sure whether confidence or stupidity were driving the other two, but the fates were aligned. The guild house was going to be robbed. When the sun set, Letos, Galcia, and Amalin approached the cobbler's guild house on the east side of town. Galcia used her cashew of stone flour to mask their scent from the guard walls as the three passed over the parapets. She also acted as lead scout, and Lettuce was impressed. For someone of relative inexperience, she knew her way through shadows. Lettuce's experience was demonstrated a dozen times, and the guards were of such a diverse variety, he was able to demonstrate all the means of silent assassination he had developed over the years. Amalin opened the vault in his unique and systematic method. As the tumblers fell beneath his fingers, he softly sang an old dirty tavern song about the 99 lovers of Boethia. He said it helped him focus and organize difficult combinations. Within seconds, the vault was open, and the gold was in hand. They left the guildhouse an hour after they entered. No alarm had been raised. The gold was gone, and corpses lay pooling blood on the stone floors within. Well done, my friends, well done. You learned well, Letos said as he poured the gold pieces into the specifically designed compartments in his tunic sleeves, where they held fast with no jingling or unusual bulges. We'll meet back at the plot and plaster tomorrow morning and split up the bounty. The group parted ways. The only person who knew the most covert through route through the city sewer system, Letos, slipped in through a duck and vanished below. Galcia threw on her shawl, muddied her face to resemble an old fella fortune teller, and headed north. Malin headed east into the park, trusting his unnatural senses to keep him away from the city watch. Now I teach them the greatest lesson of all, thought Letos as he sloshed through the labyrinthine tunnels of sludge. His guar was waiting where he left it at the city gates, making a laconic lunch of the choky shrub to which it had been leashed. On the road to Vivek City, he thought of Galcia and Amalin. Perhaps they had been caught and brought in for questioning already. It was a pity he couldn't see them undergoing interrogation. Who would break under the pressure first? Amalin was certainly the tougher of the two, but Galcia doubtless had hidden reserves. It was merely intellectual curiosity. They thought his name was Ledos. 
and that he was meeting them at the blot and plaster. The authorities wouldn't therefore be looking for a Dunmer named Sathis, celebrating his wealth miles and miles away in Vivek. As he prodded his mount onward, and the sun began rising, Sathis pictured Galcia and Imala not undergoing interrogation, but sleeping the good sleep of the wicked dreaming of how they would spend their share of the gold. Both would wake up early and rush to the blood and plaster. He could see them now, and Malin laughing and carrying on, Galcia hushing him to avoid bringing undue attention. They would take a couple flagons of grief, perhaps order a mule, a big one, and wait. Hours would pass, and so would their moods. The chains of reaction that every betrayed person exhibits. Nervousness. Doubt. Bewilderment. Anger. The sun was fully risen when Sathus reached the stables of his house on the outskirts of Vivek. He reined in his guar and filled its feed. The rest of the stalls were empty. It wouldn't be until that afternoon when his servants returned from the east of St. Realms in Nisus. They were good people, and he treated them well, but from past experiences, he knew that his servants talked. If they began to connect his absences with thefts in other towns, it was only a matter of time before they would go to the authorities or blackmail him. After all, they were human. It was best in the long run to give them a week off with pay whenever he was out of town on business. He slipped the gold into the vault in his study and went upstairs. The schedule had been tight, but Zappas had given himself a few hours to rest before his household returned. His own bed was wonderfully soft and warm compared to the dreadful mattress he had to use at the canton in Telerun. Sathas woke up some time later from a nightmare. For a second after he opened his eyes, he thought he could still hear Malin's voice nearby, singing the 99 loves of Boethia. He lay still in his bed, waiting. But there was no sound except the usual creaks and groans of his old house. Afternoon sunlight came through his bedroom window in ribbons, catching dust. He closed his eyes. The song returned, and Sathas heard the vault door in his study swing open. The smell of stone flower filled his nose as he opened his eyes. Only a little of the afternoon sunlight could pierce the inside of the burlap sack. A strong, feminine hand clamped over the mouth and a thumb jabbed under his chin. Just as his throat opened and his head would shove to one side, he heard Galcia in her typical calm voice. Thank you for the lesson, Sathis. A story of betrayal and deception. A little bit dark, but still good. The last tale I'm going to tell you before I send you off to sleep is called Menomarco, King of Worms by Horacles, and it is a Poem, a bit of an epic poem about Menemarco, King of Worms. And I'm going to read it to you. This one will be perfect for falling asleep if you are not already asleep. Alright. Are you ready? O oh, sacred isle Arteum. Where rosy light infuses air, O'er towers and through flowers, Gentle breezes flow, Softly sloping green-kissed cliffs To crashing foam below, Always springtide afternoon, Housed within its border, This mystic, misprotected home Of the Citric Order, Those counselors of kings, Cautious, wise, and fair. Ten school years and thirty since the mighty Remans fell, 
two brilliant students studied within the Citrix vault. One's heart was light and warm, the other dark and cold. The matter latter, Manamarco, whirled in a deathly dance, his soul in bones and worms, the way of the necromance, entrapping and enslaving souls, he cast a wicked spell. The former, Galarian, had magic bold and bright as day. He confronted Manamargo beneath Greg poor tower, saying your wicked mysticism is no way to wield your power, bringing horror to the spirit world. Your studies must cease. Manamargo scoffed, hating well the ways of life and peace, and returned to his dark artistry, his paints, death, and decay. O sacred isle Arteum, how slow to perceive the threat, when the ghastly truth revealed how weak the punishment, the ghoulish man of Marco from the isle of the wise was sent to the mainland dawn's beauty, more death and souls to reap. You have found a wolf and sent the beast to flocks of sheep, Galarian told his masters. A terror on Tamriel has set. Speak no more of this, the sage cloaks of grey did say. Twas not the first time Galarian thought his masters callous, unconcerned for men and mare aloof in their island palace. Twas not the time Galarian thought, twas time to build a new order to bring true magic to all, a mighty mage's guild. But twas the time he left at last fair Artaeum's azure bay. Oh, but sung we have of Venice Galarian many times before, how cast he off the Citrix chains, bringing magic to the land. Throughout the years he saw the touch of Menomarco's hand, through Tamriel's deserts, forests, towns, mountains, and seas. The dark grip stretching out, growing like some dread disease. By his dark necromancers, collecting cursed artifacts of yore. They brought to him these tools mad wizards and witches, and brought blood-tainted herbs and oils to his cave of sin, sweet akaviri poison, dust from saints, sheaves of human skin, toadstools, roots, and much more cluttered his alchemical shelf. Like a spider in his web, he sucked all their power into himself. Menemargo, Worm King world's first of the undying liches. Corruption on corruption till the rot sunk to his very core, though he kept the name Manamarco, his body and his mind were but a living, moving corpse as he left humanity behind. The blood in his veins became instead a poison acid stew. His power and his life increased as his fell collection grew. Mightiest were these artifacts, long cursed since days of yore. They say Galarian left the guild, calling it a morass. But untruth is a powerful stream, polluting the river of time. Galarian beheld Menomarkle's rise through powers sublime. To his mages and lamp knights, before my last breath, Face I must the tyranny of worms, and kill at last, undeath. He led them north to cursed lands, to a mountain pass. Oh, those who survived the battle say its like was never seen, armored with magicka, armed with ensorcelled sword and axe. Galarian cried, echoing, Worm King, 
surrender your artifacts and their power to me, and you shall live as befits the dead. A hollow laugh answered. You die first, Menamarco said. The mage army then clashed with the unholy force obscene. Imagine waves of fire and frost, and the mountains shivers. Picture lightning arcing forth, crackling in a dragon's sigh. Like leaves, the battle mages fly to rain down from the sky. At the necromancer's call, corpses burst from earth to fight, to be shattered into nothingness with a flood of unholy light. A maelstrom of energy unleash, blood cascades in rivers. Like a thunder burst in blue skies, or a lion's sudden roar, like sharp razors tearing over delicate embroidered lace, so at a touch did Galarian shake the mountain to its base. The deathly horde fell fatally. But heeding their dying cries, from the depths the thing they called Worm King did rise. Nern itself did scream in the mages and necromancers' war. His eyes burning dark fire, he opened his toothless maw, vomiting darkness with each exhalation of his breath. All sucking in the fetid air felt the icy touch of death. In the skies above the mountain, darkness overcame pale. Then Manamarco Worm King felt his dismal powers fail. The artifacts of death pulled from his putrid skeletal claw. A thousand good and evil perished then, history confirms. Among, alas, Vanus Galarian, he who showed the way. It seemed once that Menamarco had truly died that day. Scattered seemed the necromancers, wicked, ghastly fools. Back to the mages' guild, victors kept the accursed tools of him living still in undeath. Menamarco, King of Worms. Children, listen as the shadows cross your sleeping hutch, and the village sleeps away, streets emptied of the crowds, and the moons do balefully glare through the nightly clouds, and the graveyards people rest, we hope, in eternal sleep. Listen and you'll hear the whispered the footsteps creep, then pray you'll never feel the Worm King's awful touch. That was a little bit creepy, but good. I enjoyed having a little poetry, and I hope you did too. Maybe the prose sent you right off to sleep. But I may have to look somewhere else as I'm running out of good stories from the Elder Scrolls, ones that are good to read for sleep, that is. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you want to hear some other stories that you haven't already heard, you can find in the description. Reading.